Thank you. Hello, Dr. Ramzan. Thank you so much for offering this incredible opportunity for our ClubMed virtual members. My name is Mariana and I am the event spokesperson for ClubMed virtual. I will be leading today's session, reading any comments posted in the chat and facilitating the conversation as we go along. Before we start, I wanna remind everyone to maintain proper etiquette and please keep themselves on mute unless Dr. Ramzan specifies otherwise. If you have any questions, please post them in the chat and we will address them as we proceed through the session. A Google survey will be administered for Wayne State University students at the very end of the session to verify your attendance and will close 30 minutes after the session terminates. Please stay on the call for at least five minutes to ensure that the survey is working for you. The session will also be posted on YouTube if you are unable to attend or want to revisit certain topics that Dr. Ramsan discusses today. But you cannot receive shadow or attendance hours if you are not present in this call and complete the survey. All right, so I'll turn it over to you. Um, if anyone wants to turn their cameras on, you're more than welcome to. Just a very quick introduction. So I'm actually a family doctor. I live in Toronto, Canada. So I know you guys live in the US. So I'm going to try a lot of the guidelines I have are Canadian based, but I have done several presentations for paid for people in the US. So I will usually comment on things that are a little bit different. Um, so I did my bachelor's degree in biochemistry and both and my medical degree, both from the University of Ottawa, which is also in Canada. And then I decided to move out of Ottawa to Toronto to do my residency in family medicine. I've been working as a family doctor here for about six years. Uh, so I work in a low socioeconomic area. So I'll talk a little bit about that. And I also do uh, non-surgical uh, cosmetics at the clinic and I'm a medical director there. I don't comment that much about that aspect, but you know, I like I, this presentation is going to sort of talk a little bit more about my role as a family doctor. In, in a community clinic, but you're more than welcome at the end to ask me any questions about either one of those things and I'm happy to answer those questions. So um, again, very quickly, uh, the reason I wanted to just touch base about this is I feel like I am a big supporter of uh, family doctors and I'll tell you what I personally like about being a family doctor. I actually wanted to be a specialist when I was um, in medical school. I just thought it would be easier because you know a lot about a specific topic as opposed to a lot about a lot of topics. What I found is I actually really uh, fell in love as I did my rotations. And a part of it is I get to see people of all different ages. So I see newborns all the way. I think my oldest patient is like 101 or 103. And when I was young, I just thought that family doctors just, just, just saw coughs and colds because that's normally what I would go see my family doctor for. And I realized like that's just a minority of what I actually do slash see. And none of my two days are the same. So I just, you know, sometimes I have a lot of babies. Sometimes I have a lot of mental health. Sometimes I have pregnant women. So it's it, pregnant women, sorry. So uh, it, the days are all really varied. And so I kind of like that. It just sort of keeps me on my toes. Um, and the reason I sort of mentioned about how long the appointments are. So we're going to go through a case and you're going to start to realize that there's sort of a lot of things you have to be able to do in a short period of time. But the thing that's really uh, makes my, my life a little bit easier, my job a bit easier, is that uh, a lot of these patients I've now known for several years. So, you know, I, you know, don't have to spend as much time trying to like understand their background or their history because I kind of already know those things. And so the continuity of care I really enjoy. So someone who likes working in the emerge, you'll see the emergency. Um, and then, you know, whenever that person goes out of the hospital, you may not know what happened to them. So it was just, that was just generally not something that really intrigued me, but obviously there are a whole bunch of different doctors on purpose so that everyone finds their each individual role. And what I like is that if you kind of don't know what's going on with your patient, you can send them for some tests and then have them come back um, or refer them to a specialist. And we do a lot of preventative care. And what I like is seeing people through circle of life. So seeing pregnant women, and then you start taking care of their kids when they're, when the baby is born. So I'm going to present a case and we're going to kind of work through it. Um, I'll try to ask a lot of questions to make this really interactive. So the case is about Mrs. Keene, who's a 65 year old female. So she's in your practice and, you know, we're, we'll make it try to, we'll try to make it really realistic. So this is something that I would actually probably deal with. Um, so she, you know, right now I'm not 
seeing people regularly, seeing patients. I only see patients in the clinic once a week. So most of the time I'm seeing patients uh, or talking to patients through telephone uh, just because of COVID. So Ms. Keene doesn't really realize that you're, you know, you're still talking or seeing patients, which happened a lot in the beginning of the pandemic. People sort of kept their problems to themselves. So anyway, she calls you and she said, well, I don't, I didn't realize you were, you were actually talking to patients and she's been like really careful. She has really only gone out for essential errands and she calls you because she wants to do a physical. This is a common phrase that a lot of patients use. So the question I have for you guys is what does a physical mean? What does it mean to you? What does it mean? Do you think in general to people, patients? I have any takers on that? Um, Adithi said a general checkup. Yep. And if any of you guys want to unmute yourselves or you can raise your hand. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would like, to, you know, I would love to make this interactive and pretty easy going. So, you know, there's no wrong answers. We're just going to have like a fun chat about all this stuff. Um, Emma said a physical exam. Yeah. Oh, yes. So, you know what, it's, it's very interesting because so going back. So, um, you know, honestly, it really, I don't know if there's a great definition of it. That's why I kind of asked the question because I don't think there's a real perfect answer. Uh, if you ask patients, this is sort of what they, they usually come back to me saying that for them, the physical part of the exam is really important for some reason, like having your doctor come and wear a stethoscope and like, you know, listen to your heartbeat and stuff. I think for a lot of people, that's what people think of as a physical. Um, a lot of them, what they're actually referring to is actually just a blood test. So you'll, you'll see this word kind of used interchangeably. Some patients are, you know, they kind of thinking of the whole thing. They actually think about like needles and screening tests and stuff like that. Some people, when you ask them, they'll just say like, well, I'm looking for like a head to toe MRI, which doesn't really make any sense, but um, I consider it kind of like a health review. So um, when I look at it from my perspective, I, I think even if you have to ask different doctors, you may kind of get a different answer. So in, in, in my mind, like a physical exam or like a health review is basically something where you'll be able to do, whether it's a ex physical exam or some sort of testing that will make a difference if you, um, you know, do that exam or test. So it, it'll make an impact on your outcome. So it, there are some balances between trying to uh, investigating some things versus opening Pandora's box. So I'll give you an example. So it happens all the time that, for example, someone goes to the hospital, they have like a stomach pain and they, they get an ultrasound done. And then on um, the ultrasound, they see like they just incidentally by accident, they find like a little kidney cyst. They're super common. A lot of them don't require any follow up. You probably, that person probably had it maybe for years and they just didn't know about it. But then it creates kind of like some anxiety for people because now they have a cyst and they have something in their kidney and they don't really know what that means. So sometimes, you know, over investigating, like as in like doing too many tests can create issues as well too. And now we're stuck kind of following this and it may not really make an impact on the outcome for this patient, but maybe will create other things like anxiety. So I work in Canada, as I mentioned, and so uh, our healthcare system is basically government run. And that means that uh, everything is um, sort of paid for, but it's not really true. It basically just means that we pay higher taxes. The only good thing about that, that this type of like healthcare system is I don't have to worry about whether a patient can uh, afford to come to see me and afford to do certain tests. But I also have to sort of keep in mind that if I ordered a million tests for every single patient, um, well, I'm just, I'm part of like contributing to make the making the healthcare costs go up. So I have to be sort of mindful of that too. So, um, you know, this patient, like we said, comes and she's like, oh, I want to have a physical and you're on the telephone and you're at home. And so what would you actually say to her or do? Any takers? John, I can, I, can, I can help you guys out, but if you have any takers, I'll take it. Um, I'd probably ask her like maybe why she needs the physical. Sure, yeah. You know, the, the, the interesting thing is, especially when you get to know patients, and it's a lot of obviously a lot easier when you're a family doctor and you have a relationship with a patient, and a lot of times you can just kind of like ask. Um, so 
you know, what I normally tell patients, because this actually happens to me is that, you know, I haven't seen patients for, let's say, one or two years during the pandemic time, and they call me and they're just they feel like they need to get uh, like a health checkup, and they call it a physical, etc. And I'll tell them, look, we're really limiting face to face appointments. So, you know, if I have to see you, I definitely will make the effort to do it. But if there's something that really specifically that is a concern for you, I prefer you sort of focus on that. And let's deal with any active issues issues first and then because she sort of like hasn't maybe spoken to me for a while and she is over 60 she's 65 exactly you know I may want to look into her chart and sort of figure out if there's any other like tests or anything that she needs to get done so I focus a lot like I said on preventative medicine and then based on like a chart review I, I and maybe what she asks me I'll probably be able to figure out whether I need to have her come in or not. So here's what she basically says. She says well, you know, uh, she has a friend of hers who basically had a heart attack. They're very similar in age and she wants to get all heart testing done and she wants to get a blood test for everything. And she wants to, to basically know if you suggest anything else. And you, you think this is just like made up stuff, but this is actually what people tell you. They want all heart stuff and everything. They don't necessarily know what that means, but that's what they'll tell you. So what do you, how do you deal with that? What do you guys think? Again, there's no wrong answers. So this might not be right at all, but I would say that if she really feels like it's necessary for her to come in, she just should. Um, so I actually had a, a sibling go yeah. blind. Um, she had pseudotuber cerebri at the beginning yeah. of the pandemic. And the doctors refused to see her because they wanted to do like the telemed. Yep. Ended up like totally progressing her situation. And it was yep. so much worse than it had to be. Absolutely. And, and, you know, I will talk a little bit later about, I, I think I remember right, like some limitations of telemedicine. I think I can do about 80 to 90% of my job pretty well. And there's about 10. So I had a, like, I think in this, this whole year, I maybe had to send two or three people to the hospital. I've had, to, I've had to send people to go do COVID testing for sure that's separate. Um, but I had someone who had sort of like this, like, and she was younger as well too. And so she had this sort of like um, sudden sort of like weakness type of thing. And, you know, she was really actually, she was the opposite. She didn't want to go and she didn't want to be seen and she didn't want to go to the hospital. And she actually just wanted me to do telemedicine. And I told her that she had to go actually to get physically checked out. Um, anyway, she got an MRI and it, every everything was fine, but just, uh, you're absolutely right. So sometimes we have to, um, it is a limitation of telemedicine. Absolutely. I think it's a really good point. So, um, what, what I would do on the telephone is I usually ask people, so like, you know, her concern is more of the fact because she has a friend who has this and, you know, obviously like it's a, it's a great question because, you know, if, if you just, if you just actually went in, she said, I want to do physical. You're like, oh yes, you should do this test, this test, this test, and then send her off. You may actually never find out why she's actually concerned and why she actually came to talk to you. Right. So her reason for actually coming to talk to you was because she's worried about this heart stuff. Right. So what I would do is ask her if she has any symptoms of chest pain, shortness of breath, especially like if she's going up and down stairs, does she have dizziness, lightheadedness, palpitations, any other symptoms that she may sort of be describing to you. And I would also, this is what I, I do this all the time anyways, but almost like as in like every time I see a patient, I usually will go to their chart while they're talking to me and figure out have they done the appropriate like screening tests and stuff like that. Because, and especially because she asked for a physical, right? So I'm going to try to answer that question. So it sort of goes back to this question, which is like, what's actually included in a health review? So what do you guys think? Here we can wait a little bit. I know sometimes it takes a bit for them to type in the chat. <laughs> oh, sorry. You know what? You guys can... <laughs> are totally welcome by the way to like if you guys want to unmute oh sorry i'm going to give you guys the answers um you guys are totally welcome to unmute yourself and speak too yeah and you can raise your hand if you're just like worried that yeah don't worry I, that was me i was always like i didn't i didn't want to participate so it's funny being on the opposite end here um and it's totally cool you, you, you know the the presentation is supposed to be helpful for you so if you tend to not like to answer questions that's totally fine too i can i we can go over it so um well oh yeah go ahead 
Hanim, I'm so sorry if I mispronounced your name. Um, yeah, that's okay. You call me Dr. Sarah, it's easy. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry, the participant. Oh, okay. <laughs> they okay. said heart sounds, uh, blood pressure, and blood tests eventually. And then Allah said history of health issues in yeah. family members. Yeah, those are, those are great questions. So, um, you know, obviously, so it's a little bit easier for me because I, you know, I probably would have known this patient already, but if I was to sort of start from the beginning, you know, like I do have people that I'll meet that are, let's say her age, 65, brand new to my practice. And so when they come in, I'm essentially kind of like creating a, an updated chart for them, right? So it'll include their past medical history, any of their, so that would be like, have they had like a heart attack? Do they have high, high blood pressure? Do they have diabetes? Do they have any other, uh, um, other con like health conditions? Have they had any surgeries? Someone mentioned family history. Um, social history is actually quite important. Uh, so, you know, want to know if they're a smoker, do they drink, do, do they have, do they drink alcohol regularly? How much do they do drugs? You'd be surprised. I had, a, I realized I had a lot of patients, a lot of gentlemen in their 60s who are big cocaine users it was very popular i guess when they were younger so you'd be surprised um so you i just feel like you never you know, never um uh, never never know so it's always important to ask questions um i ask about like people's work about their relationship background meaning like their ethnic background um especially for where i work this is important um so while our healthcare is covered there's some medications aren't and so uh, you don't have to know whether I can give something like I have to tailor medications accordingly. Um, you know, does the person uh, the relationship is more like, you know, do they live by themselves? Like, am I worried about her being alone? That kind of thing. Um, does she have like kids who live close by, blah, blah, blah. Medications and supplements. Um, so a lot of people won't tell you about that. Allergies and, and needles. The last time she had a blood test, um, preventative tests, which we'll talk about. And then I actually have reminders in my chart. So for example, remember that, that um, thing I talked about like earlier about having like incidentally finding that kidney cyst. So if, if I notice that someone went to the hospital and that's what happened, I'll actually make a note in their chart that said like, you know, like a uh, kidney cyst found on this date and like we'll repeat it in whatever time the radiologist recommends to, to have it retested. So I actually have a reminder. So whenever I open someone's chart, I'll also just make sure that they're up to date on all of those things. And, um, you know, so, and, and by chart review, like right now, the reason I say only vitals is because I'm referring, to, I'm, I'm still assuming I'm still on the telephone with her, right? So uh, I can go back and look at her old vitals. And the reason why I might do that is, it happens all the time too. I'll catch someone, you know, who I saw right before the pandemic started and their blood pressure was a bit high and I told them to come back and see me and they haven't done that. So to me, that means oh, I need to follow up on their blood pressure. So um, what do you guys know or think about what a preventative test might be? And do you guys have any idea which test might be important for someone who's like 65 and above? We'll say female, just make it easier. Um, well, like, while well, we wait for people to type in the chat, cause yeah. I don't to take a minute. Um, I guess I would say a lot of the, uh, like to feeling to make sure they don't have uh, breast cancer. Yeah. Years. Um, Nico said bone density, did he yeah. sugar? Really Richard said a mammogram. Yep. So again, mammogram and bone test. Yeah, those are great answers. So like essentially what I think of is, uh, well, I should say, I think of what, what a preventative test, what it should be is something that can basically detect something um, early on. And basically the, the, the thought would be that if you did this test and you detected something early, it would improve someone's prognosis or ability to be able to treat that condition. Sometimes there are some tests that you can do, but it doesn't actually affect the, the long-term outcome. So some of those things uh, don't have clear evidence to do them, but you can still consider doing them. So that's why this, this presentation, there's a lot of, it's actually a lot of uh, gray area. So there, this doesn't, there's not always a perfect answer. And so I think if you ask different people, um, we know that there are certain guidelines and I'll go over, you know, which, what things are kind of important, but there are, like you said, there are some, some gray areas. So the, the purpose of a preventative test or a screening test is to make sure 
that, you know, like you said, that you detect something early, but it only, it assumes that you have no underlying risk factors. So what that means is that if you have a family history of breast cancer, you're not going to follow the general guidelines because you're at higher risk and you may have to follow a different guideline. So that's the one thing to sort of take into account. So it's assuming that you're like just someone of the general public without any other higher risks. So I'll, I'll comment on the, like I said, these are like the Canadian guidelines. I, I've, I've looked at the ones from the States. They're, they're pretty similar. And um, the, the, the main basis is probably the same types of tests to be done, which are mammograms. Um, we do them every two years between ages 50 and 74. You guys are pretty similar. And the interesting thing about that is that, um, you know, you do see people who have breast cancer early on. You have people in their 30s who have breast cancer. So, and some of these don't necessarily, some of these women don't necessarily have um, a family history. So again, this is, you know, these are guidelines and they're called guidelines on purpose, which is that, you know, if you see someone who, so, it also is very, one, one thing it doesn't include is that if you have someone who has a specific symptom, if they have a lump, they're not, they're not part of this, uh, like a screening process. That's to basically, you're trying to like rule out something. So you would just get them a mammogram kind of at regardless of any age. If someone felt like a lump there, depends on their age, whether you think it's a, it's a cyst or not. Um, but for most people, uh, when they do, when you talk about screening is that you have to have no other symptoms. You can screen people in their 40s, and there are some new recommendations that suggest you should talk to your patient about doing them at an earlier age. The reason we don't do them between 40 and 50 regularly or routinely is the fact that sometimes um, women in that age group have really dense breasts. So as a result, you cannot see through them through, with the mammogram, and as a result, um, you may have to do the mammogram a little bit more often to be able to sort of give someone a reassurance that the mammogram was in fact negative. So, you know, I can sometimes barely convince my patients to do a mammogram every two years during that time period. So for me to convince them to do a mammogram every year between 40 to 50, and then every two years is a difficult um, thing to do. Some patients are like really keen and they really want to do it. And if, if the moment someone turns 75 doesn't mean that they don't have to do the test. It just means that the guidelines no longer say that they have to do it. And basically that they didn't find that the outcome long-term uh, was beneficial for people over 75. Having said that, you know, you can still have a conversation with your patient about whether they want to continue doing screening after that time. Most of my patients get tired of doing it, like I said, so they don't really want to do it beyond that point, but I do have a conversation with them about it. Colon cancer screening, we, we, there are different options on how you can screen people. Uh, we do, um, we usually give people the option of doing a colonoscopy, which is a camera up the bum, uh, and you do it every 10 years if your colonoscopy is normal, and you do it at earlier intervals if um, your colonoscopy is not, is if you find something on your colonoscopy. So it means like, let's say you found a little benign growth, um, they will take, they take it off. And if the, if the growth is, turns out to be not cancerous, they may say you may repeat it, for example, in five years. The alternative is doing a stool test where you take a little sample of stool and you actually, we do, we actually send it in the mail, which is kind of interesting. It's a government run program. And if you do the test every one or two years, it's actually the equivalent of the um, screening ability of a colonoscopy done every 10 years. The ages are pretty much the same, but like I said, you can, can be varied as well too. We do cervical cancer screening every three years. So interestingly that we, our age is actually 21, uh, for 21 and sexually active. Um, and it's interesting in the States, you guys are 25 and we have actually recently changed our age as well too in part in some of the areas in Canada. So I think we're all kind of coming to the same type of thing. The whole point of all these numbers is not really anything for you to remember at all. It's more just the different types of screening tests that exist. Uh, someone mentioned bone density tests. So that's a, that was a really good one because I, I don't think it's something that's often thought of. We, here we recommend it for anyone who's over 65, assuming they have no other symptoms. If someone has other symptoms, then they, they're depending on what it is. It's a long list. It's not really important. You may need to be screened a bit earlier than that. Um, blood tests are something that people ask. Sorry, did someone have a question?
Maybe not. Okay. I'm going to continue. Um, blood tests, something that people often ask a lot about. If you actually look at the guidelines, they'll tell you to actually screen at age 40. But if I look at my population, I have a lot of South Asian population and I have a lot of people from um, the Caribbean and um, from Africa. And a lot of these people will develop either slightly elevated sugars, diabetes, or high cholesterol even in their 30s. So for me, while the guideline tells me this, I will actually kind of adjust myself accordingly. If someone is obese, if someone has high blood pressure or any risk factors, then I will usually screen a little bit earlier than that. We used to do a lot of like EKGs, those are like that, the heart test where you do the heart monitor, urine tests, and stress tests is basically where you go on to uh, basically like a treadmill and you're trying to see if you're, when your heart rate kind of goes up and you need like when you're exercising, whether or not you have enough blood flow to the heart. So we used to do these kind of routinely and they're not part of the screening process because of the fact that you get a lot of false positives basically means that they come out to be positive, but there's not, there doesn't necessarily mean that you have um, a, whatever the disease is. So a, a urine test that shows a little bit of bacteria doesn't necessarily mean that you have um, an infection. And so sometimes people get stuck doing a lot of extra tests. That's the kind of caveat I mentioned before. So to not open Pandora's box where we tell people not to do these screening tests. Again, if someone has symptoms of any of those, like, you know, like a bladder infection or they have any type of like shortness of breath, et cetera, then they should get tested. Okay, so we, we've, we've, we've dealt with a lot of things. Um, so now we have to go back and like think about what we would um, do for Mrs. Keene. So um, to answer the question is to, to know what to do, we have to kind of like look at her chart. So I'm gonna give you some information about what I know about her. So she's got a bit of arthritis in both of her knees. She doesn't have any like heart conditions, diabetes, heart disease, that kind of thing. She had a C-section for uh, both of her kids. Um, she's had her appendix removed. She has a thyroid nodule. We'll talk about that in a bit. Um, she's got no family history of really anything significant. The only thing that's important is that her dad was diagnosed with colon cancer. She doesn't know the exact age because she herself is 65. So, I mean, at that time they, they didn't really pay attention to these things. She thinks around age 60. Um, she's married, she's got two kids. 35 and 38. She doesn't smoke. She has maybe occasional glass of wine with her meals, no other drugs. She's a personal support worker, but she's retired now. She, you know, is independent, walks on her own. She walks about 10, 15 minutes a day. She's from Nigeria, came to Canada about 25 years ago. And uh, you look at her chart and her last blood pressure was 142 on 88, which was done about a year ago. Um, again, same example, like I told her to monitor, but she forgot the pandemic happened. Her BMI, her body mass index is 28, which is a little bit high, but she's also um, from, she's also African-American. So um, there, there's sometimes the BMI doesn't necessarily apply to them, but we would be able to check her weight and see if she might be a little bit overweight. Um, her last blood test was two years ago. Everything was good. Um, and so, you know, a, a thing that you noted in her chart was that two years ago, she went to a walk-in clinic, she had a cold and they had, they noticed some like lymph nodes, which are like, the, like the, um, little swelling that you can some in large lymph nodes get a little swelling sort of like around the neck area, which you can get that when you do have a cold. And because she was anxious at the time, she asked if she could get an ultrasound done. And of course, you know, they found something. So they found a little thyroid nodule. Um, it's really, really tiny. It's three millimeters. And we monitor that every year now as a result. And the last time she did that was about a year and a half ago. So these are like very common things. So um, these are, she takes Tylenol for her arthritis, but she doesn't really do anything else. She's got no allergies. She takes vitamin D. Her mammogram was two years ago. It's all normal. Her colonoscopy was six years ago, which was normal. Her pap test was two years ago, which was normal. And then she had a tetanus shot four years ago and she hasn't really had any other needles in the last bit if you kind of look. So it's a lot of information. So on based on that kind of stuff, what do you think we should tell her? I don't know if you guys need me to go back to anything, but what should we tell her? Um, so while people are typing in the chat, there was someone yeah. who had a question. Um, yeah. who asked, are there any tests related to menopause or menopausal complications? 
Yeah, great question. So technically the, the definition of menopause is no period for one year. So we, again, also used to do, you can do these like blood tests to sort of confirm you're in menopause, but you actually don't need to do confirmation tests to confirm someone in, is in menopause. Um, Sometimes you may want to do it, for example, in someone who is a little bit younger and you're trying to figure out, is this person not having periods because of menopause or for some other reason? Sometimes um, you'll see people who have like periods and then, you know, they have a period and they won't get a period for several months and they get it back again. And you might in that instant, if it's been going on for a while, and let's say the average age of menopause is uh, 51. So if if someone's around that age, you're not sure if it's because of a hormonal change or sometimes you can have something, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of, they're called fibroids or like benign growths in the uterus. And sometimes those can cause abnormal bleeding as well. So sometimes you'll do the blood work and to sort of that, that hormone blood work to sort of figure out what the diagnosis is. But as such, you don't actually have to do it for a screening test. I don't know if they do it differently in the States, but I don't think so. Um, there's, there, it doesn't really, it doesn't really change your um, prognosis or your, like how you're going to be able to treat someone. If someone has menopausal symptoms, which is a totally different thing, you don't actually have to necessarily do blood work. You can actually just treat them for menopausal symptoms. I don't know if that answers the question. No, yeah, thank you for answering that. Yeah, of course. So uh, we were here. So what, what do we... What should we tell her to do? Um, well, I still, some people haven't put in the chat, but I think that yeah. the fact that her dad had colon cancer. Yeah. Like, and the fact that her thyroid was, I know that the lymph nodes are, yeah, sometimes get growths because of cancer. So maybe a colonoscopy. Yeah. So she, yeah. So definitely. So, um, so, Technically, if you actually kind of like look at the list of what we could sort of talk to her about, she's technically due for a mammogram because she had it two years ago. So de technically also due for a colonoscopy, like you said, because of her family history. So, you know, she should have probably gone it last year. And probably I would have made myself a reminder in my chart. But again, probably pandemic for that reason. We, you know, we've some things have kind of fallen through the cracks. So that would be something that I would be like, yes, now you have to definitely go get that done. Um, her blood pressure, we'll talk a little, like I'm going to get into that where we're going to talk about what normal blood pressure is, but her blood pressure is a bit high. So, um, you know, the options would be, you know, uh, does she have a machine at home? Can she check her blood pressure at home? Um, a lot of times their pharmacies will have the machines, but now because of COVID, a lot of places have closed them down, at least here in Canada. And, you know, her background, so um, as a uh, Black Canadian, or uh, she's a, a African American, she's actually at higher risk of uh uh, having high blood pressure. So we have to sort of keep that in mind. She is due for her thyroid ultrasound repeat, even though the, you know, the thyroid um, nodule was pretty small, like we should follow up with that. Um, she's never done a bone test, right? So she should get that done. And then, you know, we, you know, her blood, last blood test was two years ago. So we may consider wanting to do sort of that. And, you know, sugars are close to her, probably the basis of what she, basic stuff that she needs. But if she's got high blood pressure, she, we may need to check her kidney test as well too. And then, you know, talk to her about some needles as well to immunizations. So, um, but we, you know, coming back to, so, you know, sometimes your to-do list is slightly different than a patient's to-do list, right? So we looked at her chart and we're like, oh, these are all the things you need to do. It's a long list actually. Um, but, you know, you have to remember that her concern was actually the heart testing, right? Like, so what should we tell her? What should we do about the heart testing where she wants to get everything tested? Check question. Give you guys a couple of seconds or you want me to? Um, yeah, I guess, it, sorry, someone said, could you repeat the question? Oh, about the heart testing? But this one, okay. so um, the question was, um, you know, she when she Mrs. King came in, right? Like we when we asked her a little bit about what she's worried about, she was worried about her um, her friend having had a heart attack, and she basically said she wants to get all heart tests done, right? So we, you know, if you go back to the preventative stuff, right? Like they don't actually talk about heart disease in the sense of doing heart testing, right? Um, so the the main 
things for prevention is to mostly just ensure sugars, cholesterol are low or within a normal range and, and blood pressure within a normal range. So, but you know, she's wanting to, she's asking about what other, she's asking basically like, should I get heart testing done? And you have to be able to answer her question, which is like, should we order a heart test? And what would, what kind of heart test would we order? If any, what would we do? Um, so Laura, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. I'm just like, that's like the Spanish pronounce. Yep. Um, so she said, could we listen to her harder chest and do an EKG? Maybe if everything seems fine, there's no need for further testing. Yeah, that was actually not a bad suggestion. So, you know, uh, one thing I didn't tell you was the fact that she didn't really have any symptoms, right? If she told me that she basically like, yes, she gets short of breath going up and down stairs, or she's noticed a change in uh, like a little bit of pressure into her chest, or she's noticed that like sometimes she's sitting and her heart beats a bit faster, or she's been getting a little bit dizzy or something like that, something that would make me sort of like partially concerned about that, you know, it, it, she's she's not super active. She does walk around and stuff like that. And she tells us that she doesn't really have any symptoms. So at this point, she really does not require any invasive tests, right? And we talked about, it's called a false positive. Basically it can make the, so this, this happens, you do a stress test, like that exercise test. And sometimes it comes like either borderline or it comes back positive. And then people have to go do a more invasive test, right? And then people get really anxious about doing that thing. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be positive. So there's sort of, I guess the hard part is that people want to be able to like um, figure out if they have something, but there's a balance between sort of like investigating and over investigating. And hence why we kind of have guidelines in place. But I think a lot of um, stuff we deal with is trying to understand um, where we think we're, we're actually going to make an impact in her. And I'm not sure in her situation that we're necessarily the, the, the cardiac tests, the heart tests are going to be as important as like, the, we already have a long list of other things, right? So now we have to basically, you know, go back to her and say, well, we have to and make sure that she understands where we're coming from. Say like, you know, acknowledge the fact that this is what you're worried about. Um, what I usually tell them like at this point, there's not, this, this is not an, a, a test that's really necessary to do. But I'll, what I always do is I open, I always leave the door open. So what that means is I always say, well, listen, if anything changes, you do have any symptoms and I label them out, then I do want you to come back. And then if she's still a bit anxious, I'll say, listen, we actually have a lot of other tests that we need to do when we get all those tests back and I will call you and we will review this or I'll have you come in and we'll review this. It gives us another opportunity to have this conversation with her and make sure that her fears are sort of um, uh, taken care of. Um, there are like most of the time this actually works for most people. And again, it's because I have being able to have a good relationship with patient over years. I know that if I like, you know, if someone feels like um, have I, have I, let's say ordered a test for someone that I didn't necessarily feel like it was important? Yes. Um, sometimes dealing with people's anxiety is more important than the alternative, which is to, you know, it, you know, you can tell them, look, this is not going to be a useful test for this and this reason. And if they still choose to go do it, assuming it's not going to be harmful to them, I have in some situations bent the rules because guidelines are guidelines. Um, but on the, on the whole, this, for this particular patient, she does not actually need to get any of those tests done. Um, someone talked about the physical. I'm going to come back to it. I haven't forgotten about that, that comment. So um, what about immunization? So uh, some things uh, that are um, that we follow in terms of guidelines is uh, having ensuring that someone has a tetanus shot every 10 years. She hasn't had a flu shot. Um, she hasn't had a pneumonia shot and shingles uh, vaccine. So the pneumonia vaccine here, we can, so some of our vaccines are covered and some of them are not. So if they're not covered, it means that people would have to pay for it. And so in Canada, uh, no one likes to pay for anything unless they're really sort of forced into it. So uh, you can give pneumonia vaccine at an earlier age and should be given to people who are at high risk, who have other medical conditions. But assuming she's a relatively healthy patient at 65, she can be offered a pneumonia vaccine and there's a one dose of that that, that is covered. Uh, shingles is basically, I don't know if you guys know what shingles is, basically like a, a painful rash that you can get and it comes from reactivated chickenpox. So you've had chickenpox and then the 
it, chicken pox is a virus that basically hides away in your nerves. And then for some reason, years later, it sort of gets reactivated. And as a result of that, um, you can get this really painful rash. And the problem is not the rash, is that the pain that comes with it and the fact that the pain can last for sometimes days, weeks, or months afterwards. So this is why um, we try to protect people as well too. Here in where I'm living, two doses are covered between 65 and 70. It's very arbitrary. Uh, does not necessarily mean that you cannot offer it for people at a younger age or older age, I should say even. Okay, so there's a lot that we sort of kind of had to go through. So you have to remember, uh, just to go back, this was, you know, this one, this is one patient that you're talking to, right? So, and this is, you know, a normal 10 to 15 minute conversation you're having on the phone or same, same time in person. So it's a lot to deal with. You get obviously a lot faster as you deal with it, obviously a lot faster when you already know the patient. You can, I can scan someone's chart pretty quickly and come up with those sort of like conclusions uh, within a couple of minutes. But when I first started, no, it took me a long time. So um, we have to make sure, like we said, that we deal with her main problem, which was the heart discussion, tell her that we can talk about it again. Um, we have to get her, you know, all these requisitions to do the tests. Um, it's cool. We have the ability now to email it to people or they can come pick it up. The colonoscopy, which is the, the uh, camera up the bum, we have to organize it. So that's work that I have to do. It takes a couple of seconds. Um, I need to follow up on her blood pressure. So we either have to have her see if she has a machine at home or we have ability, we, we can book patients in just to have their blood pressure checked and they can do that actually with the nurses. So they get their blood pressure and if they need any needles and then we're gonna sort of touch base with her afterwards. So someone, and so, you know, and the reason I put it like this was like, what about the physical exam? So interesting thing about physicals, actually, if you look at the evidence behind them, there's actually not that many things in the physical that actually make a very big difference when it comes to screening. So that screening means that you people don't have any symptoms. So someone listening to your heart, if you don't have any symptoms is very unlikely to kind of affect your outcomes down the road. Interestingly, blood pressure and weight, there is actually evidence that those things are helpful. Um, it, a lot of these things are also really difficult during the pandemic. So we have to also be cognizant of like, how do I, you know, who do I pick to come in to see, right? Um, I think in all the years I've done this, I've maybe have found one person in all these years that maybe had something turned out to be like, a, I sorry, what I meant was a little murmur uh, that didn't turn out to be anything. So, and amongst all the physicals I've done on people, if someone has any chest pain or shortness of breath, et cetera, or any symptoms, then hundred percent doing a physical exam is very important, but it's interesting. Physical exams make people feel like they're they're healthy because they, they feel like you've kind of had a quick listen to them. Even when I look into people's ears, there's actually no evidence that it makes a difference, but people really like it. Um, there's actually not even that much evidence for breast exams, which is actually really interesting. But I actually do offer um, breast exams for women um, for a couple of reasons. Um, not to everyone, as so I ask people, I'll tell them there's not that much evidence for it, but if you would like, I will do it. A lot of people do want me to do it. Um, also, it, it, it helps me kind of keeping my skills up so I can feel the difference between a mass that's concerning. And a lot of people have really dense breast tissue, which has a very different feel to it. Um, you can tell people to do self exams. The only problem with self exams is that they have to be very consistent in how they're doing it. Uh, if they don't do breast exams on a regular basis, then sometimes they'll find those lumpy breasts that I'm talking about. And then it creates more anxiety as well too. And then we order an ultrasound and we kind of go down a route again. Um, physical, another thing on a physical where, you know, you, you know, if you, if as a doctor, I, if I quickly scan someone's skin, um, it is possible to pick up small skin cancers as well too. So the physical, although, you know, is not super duper helpful, there are some things on it that can be helpful. So let's see what Mrs. Keene. So Mrs. Keene says that she wants to hold off on the needle tree now. She agrees to do all the other tests. She has a machine at home. So she wants to sort of do that at home. She really like doesn't want to come in. Some of my patients are like this, are very anxious to come in. Um, she does feel okay with the understanding of being able to come back if there's anything related to the heart. And so we're going to follow up with her uh, after her blood test or actually all of her tests. So I'll explain what this means. So, you know, we get her blood test back, her A1C, which is a sugar test. It's an average sugar test over the last three months. And it's 
not it's a non-fasting blood test you could be fasting or not fasting but you can't cheat on it so it's your average sugar over last three months um so it kind of is a pretty good idea of what someone's sugar level is like we'll go over what that actually means just for simplicity's sake we'll i'll just tell you that her cholesterol is normal her kidney test mammogram bone density test is normal her thyroid ultrasound shows a nodule it's a i'd say 0 0.3 0 0.4 is pretty much the same um, she doesn't have any other symptoms, but her blood pressure is now 148 on 92 and she hasn't done her colonoscopy because that obviously just, you know, takes some time to kind of do that. So, uh, the question is, what do you do now? Well, to answer some of the stuff, we actually have to go back a little bit, which is to understand, um, what a normal blood pressure is. Right. So I, this one, I actually took from the American Heart Association, just because it's a little bit different here in Canada than it is in the States. So for us, high blood pressure is considered anything over one, 140 over 90. Uh, when the systolic blood pressure is when the heart is contracting and then the diastolic is when the heart is relaxing. Um, so you guys have a category that you guys call stage one, which is when your blood pressure is more than 130 on 80. Uh, and we actually don't have that. And um, it's not a, bad, not a bad thing that you guys do. So what the only thing it'll do is that you'll have more people who are diagnosed with blood pressure, high blood pressure because there will be more people just in general who are gonna have a blood pressure slightly higher than the normal. And I think the purpose of it is to pick up some of those people who are gonna potentially end up in higher risk categories before they actually do it. So her blood pressure in the range it is, she's already down here anyways. So in the over 140 and 90, so she definitely has high blood pressure. So to diagnose high blood pressure, you actually need to have several values, like somewhere between four to six values that are above the target range. So if someone measures the blood pressure once and it's elevated, I don't consider that high blood pressure unless their blood pressure is let's say greater than 180 on 120, like the highest blood pressure, and especially if they have that in any other symptoms, they have high blood pressure. But if their blood pressure is kind of borderline, you need a couple of values to be able to sort of confirm the diagnosis. And the reason why hypertension is important is that a lot of times people actually feel completely fine, just like this patient, but people who have high blood pressure are at risk of heart attack, strokes, um, issues with their vision, heart failure, kidney failure, and actually something that's not known that much, which is actually sexual dysfunction. And so going back to her sugar tests, uh, you see that, you know, if we're looking at type two diabetes, this, the first um, column is the A1C test. That's a sugar test that's over the past three months. And so if you look anything, um, this is based on the CDC guidelines. So this is in the States. So for us, it's slightly different, but you guys do less than 5.7 is normal. It's 5.7 to 6.4 and 6.5 and above is diabetes. Ours is the pre-diabetes is 6.1 to 6.4. I mean, it doesn't really matter, but basically you guys include a little bit more of the people who have slightly higher um, sugar level and, and include those in the pre-diabetes. And I think it's to sort of, again, target those people who are at high risk. So regardless, based on her value, uh, you know, she, her, she's kind of like in the pre-diabetes area and where her sugars are 6.2. So though she has no symptoms, she actually has high blood pressure and pre-diabetes, right? So in terms of the next steps, so just to kind of go over everything, the thyroid ultrasound we did would seem like it was pretty normal. She doesn't have any symptoms, can be monitored, and I'll make myself a reminder in my chart to do this again in a year. We tell her about her pre-diabetes, her sugars and her blood pressure being high. Um, we're lucky here, especially in my clinic, I have a, a dietitian especially and a diabetic dietitian. So I can refer this patient directly there. And you know, it's, it's sometimes difficult for us as doctors, unless we have like a separate appointment just booked to discuss a diet, um, you know, when the dietitians speak to patients, they have almost, sometimes they have like 30 minutes to a full hour booked uh, with patients. So you can have a really in-depth conversation, whereas I'm sometimes don't have the time to be able to sit down with people and really understand and the, the, and, and the really benefit of seeing a dietitian is, especially in, in the area I work in, they actually will know and understand different cultural backgrounds and how, you know, the uh, diet needs to be adjusted accordingly. 
So for her salt, so for her, sorry, her blood, high blood pressure, we can tell her that she should reduce salt because salt is uh, something that can raise blood pressure. We can, you know, she, she exercises 10 to 15 minutes a day. It's every two to three days, I think. So we can definitely encourage her to try to increase her exercise that will also have an effect on her blood pressure. But technically, you know, where her blood pressure is, we know that she probably had this high blood pressure even a year ago, right? This is before the pandemic. And so she probably should be on a blood pressure medication, but this is a very common thing. Patient agrees to do, see the dietitian and do all this other lifestyle changes, but she doesn't really want to take a medication. Very common thing. So based on that, so let's say she's got high blood pressure and this kind of thing. What do you do now? What would you tell her? Um, so Nika actually put in the chat a little bit before, but I feel like yeah. this for this now. Um, they asked, would you start monitoring her heart if uh, you find that her blood pressure is high? Yeah, a oh, great question. So technically, though, a lot of people have high blood. Like, I have a, like, a ton of people who have high blood pressure, and they range from, I have some people in, in their late 20s, as high up as, as the oldest patient you can think of. If I started to put everyone who was on a high, who had high blood pressure and forced or not forced or suggested they got heart testing done, we would be doing a lot of extra heart testing. So actually, though her sugar being elevated and her um, blood pressure being high put her at a higher risk, I would actually focus more on trying to, to like work on the modifiable risk factors rather than actually send her for heart testing. She actually doesn't really need it. Again, with uh, like, I always keep that caveat where like I'm, I am the first person to sort of like tell people to go do a test if I think it's absolutely necessary or even if I'm concerned about something, I don't really know the answer to it. I'll be the first person to send them, but she doesn't actually need that. What she actually needs is probably to lose weight, to reduce her salt, do some lifestyle things and actually get her, the biggest thing is actually getting her blood pressure down and her sugars down. Those are the probably two most important things. Um, thank you for answering that. Yeah, uh, of course. You also had a question. So yeah. that, are there any negative effects if she doesn't agree to taking the blood pressure medication? Great question. So um, it's probably sort of like my next question. So um, I have, again, in the, in the time period I've done this, of uh, being sort of worked as a family doctor, I definitely have dealt with people who do not want to, to take blood pressure medications. And so, you know, I've tried different approaches, I'll be honest. Um, sometimes I will take a very like strong route because I feel like with certain people, you have to be a bit stern. I tried the like, you know, this is what's going to happen if you don't take your blood pressure route. Uh, I tell people I'm not your mother. I can't force you, but this is what I recommend. Essentially, you know, your job as the doctor is to tell people what's going on. So you tell them you have high blood pressure, you tell them the risks of what, what can happen if they don't treat their blood pressure. You can say that you're at high risk of having a heart attack and having a stroke. And maybe that might work to our advantage because again, she was worried about her friend having a heart attack. So maybe that angle might work. Um, but really all you have to actually do is, is eventually document it that you've talked to the patient about it. Um, the good thing about being a family doctor is you can come back to the conversation later. Um, in the beginning, when you first start, you're very keen on believing that you can convince everyone. The reality is you cannot convince everyone. I have a patient who uh, has um, bad diabetes and he's been in and out of the hospital, like will take his insulin then stop and take and stop. And he, he just comes in and out of the hospital. He has, um, am, has had amputations of most of the fingers um, in both of his hands. Uh, he's had multiple infections and, and he still won't take anything. He won't still improve his taking care of himself and, and whether, and sometimes he's on insulin. Like I said, sometimes he's not. Um, we've had multiple conversations about it. And to be fair, like this within the last couple of months, he's relatively young, he passed away. Um, and we've been talking about it for years and he would always say, yes, I know. Um, but he just didn't want to do anything about it. So, you know, the thing with medicine also is a lot of stuff we do is just all based on risk management and trying to reduce people's risk. I have people who have the worst habits and they've never had a heart attack or a stroke or any of those things. They have 
these high blood pressure, high cholesterol, everything like that. So, you know, sometimes people, they, you have, it, it's whether or not someone's willing to take the risk. Obviously our goal is to make sure that we reduce people's risk, right? So again, all we can really do is make sure we talk to her about it and document it. I've, I've also, to be fair, also convinced a lot of people to change their mind. I've had people come back to tell me that, you know, the fact that I did convince them really did help them. So I uh, wouldn't take it as a, I wouldn't give up on patients, but sometimes you have, I have to, I've now learned that I cannot convince everyone. So that's actually one of the big lessons I've learned in, in practicing. So like I said, so see, so basically we will talk to her about it. Uh, we'll tell her that she needs to review or get her sugars tested. You could test as early as three months because the A1C is, you know, uh, it, it's an average test over three months. If she's diabetic, she for sure needs a blood test every three months. I guess you could sort of say some, some well-controlled diabetics for years can kind of wait out till six months, but most diabetics are, are have their blood pressure, their sugars checked every three months. Um, you know, for people to, when the people make lifestyle changes, so if they're adjusting their diet and this kind of thing, to be able to see differences in their sugars and their cholesterol does take several months. So if you kind of go a little bit too early, you may not give people enough time to sort of, um, see that difference. And, and you don't, you want them to be encouraged, not discouraged, right? So you want to give them a little bit of time to sort of like get going kind of thing. Um, her blood pressure is a big issue, right? So we're going to tell her that we need to sort of follow up with her. And, you know, one thing we could do is because she's checking at home is we could actually have her come in and, you know, actually check in the clinic and compare it to her blood pressure machine just to make sure it's calibrated and it's actually giving us the right reading. And, you know, sometimes I do this, I sneak up on people and I'm like, well, if you're going to come in, then maybe we can talk about the needles at the same time. So, cause you know, she remember, I don't know if you remember, but she didn't want to take any needles or she didn't want to get immunized for anything. So a month later, she comes back and now she's like in your clinic because you actually bring her in and her blood pressure is now 150 and 95. And whether you check on her machine or your machine, it's pretty much the same. She, you know, we didn't give her too much time in the lifestyle, but, we, you know, she tried to reduce her salt and this kind of thing. She weighs five pounds more than she did. But this is going back to at the beginning of the pandemic is very common. So I'm seeing a lot of people who, you know, during the pandemic, you know, were a little bit more lenient on what they were eating or doing, weren't working, that kind of thing. Um, so she's gained a little bit of weight from them. So what are we going to tell her now? Are we worried, not worried? Um, well, I guess I would be slightly worried just because. Yeah. So high. Yeah, it's, it's definitely higher than it was before. Yeah. So, I mean, this would be, so sometimes like now, you know, this is an, an, this is the conversation we're having again. And sometimes these conversations can be better in person. So might be not a bad idea. We're, you know, face to face with her and, you know, she's, she's been pretty good on all the other tests and stuff. She was really, you know, they called her Mrs. Keen on purpose. She did all the things we sort of talked to her generally about. And you know what, she sort of, you know, agrees. Sometimes I'll actually prime people or get people ready for this conversation where I'll say, you know, a month prior, I'll say, listen, you know, if your blood pressure is not better in a month, then do you agree to take medications? And, you know, they say, yeah, yeah, you know, I don't want to be on anything now, but yeah, fine. So you, and you, you kind of, sort of um, not make them promise, but kind of like make sure that's ingrained in their head so that when the conversation comes up, they're not really surprised that now you suddenly want to put them on a medication. So that way it's, it often really helps. doesn't mean that she should stop doing the other stuff. So she'd still see the dietitian and, you know, obviously she's gained some weight. So, you know, she might, probably needs to go back to some of the stuff she was doing before. Um, and, you know, we should touch base with her. So if we start a, a medication, we should touch base with her again um, within the month to see, make sure that the, the medication is working, check out her new values, make sure she doesn't have any side effects. So let's assume that we do that and her blood pressure is fine. And now we're seeing her uh, five months later, she sort of comes back in your clinic and now her blood pressure is back down to 120 on 80. Her A1C, her sugar test is now down. She's lost four pounds, which is not bad. Like, so she's kind of almost lost all of the weight that she had. Um, and then she finally agrees to do the pneumonia, get the pneumonia vaccine and the shingles vaccine. And now you've gotten the results for her colonoscopy. So uh, you consider this, 
not bad. Like her blood pressure is much better. Her sugars have come down. It's still not into the normal range exactly. Her, her weight is a little bit higher, but considering all that, I mean, you have to remember she's also 65, right? So, um, you know, she didn't, she didn't get the flu shot, but we'll assume maybe five months later, we're in the summertime and there's, you know, we're not giving flu shots. So overall, she actually um, kind of like pull through. So uh, if I pull, you know, this example and just sort of like talk about it in, in like an overall thing, right? Uh, so important things sort of to learn. So you guys will eventually, you know, if, you, if, if medicine is the way you want to go, you'll, you'll learn all about the whole medical aspect of things. But I think what's kind of interesting from my perspective, um, having done this for a while, is like what you get taught and what actually happens in real life is very different. So, you know, sometimes what people are focused on or patients are focused on or can be different. And so we have to kind of take into account what they're thinking, what we're thinking, and kind of, I try really to work with people and try to understand um, where they're sort of coming from and, you know, to educate them and to also sort of like encourage them to be involved in their health. Um, so our, 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 like we mentioned before, our purpose is to tell them about the risks and benefit of doing something versus if they didn't do it, like, you know, if they're turning to starting medication, what would be the side effects be? Um, and, you know, like I said, we do a lot of preventative medicine. So what, what she probably doesn't realize is that with us being sort of really focused on a lot of the blood pressure and the sugar um, stuff, we're probably reducing her risk of having those heart issues later on. It, there's nothing that's absolute. You can never make any promises to anyone, but um, you know, that's probably part of it. But we also, you know, did so much screening stuff in terms of like the colon and the mammograms and the, you know, she'll, you know, her pap test is already up to date. And so the nice thing about, like I said, family medicine is you can keep on seeing people. And so while she came in with sort of a simple issue, which was like, she doesn't have symptoms and she wants to have a physical, there was actually a lot to sort of unpack there. And, you know, it's okay if people have a different plan or different idea than what you have in mind. And, you know, you just document that and, and try to understand sometimes where people are coming from. Sometimes people just want some time to see if they can, you know, a lot of people really want to not be on a medication. I understand that, like, you know, once you're on a blood pressure medication, you're probably on it for life. And, you know, she was pretty healthy and didn't really take any medication. So before she commits herself, I think it's reasonable to give her a bit of time to see if she can, you know, do it a bit on her own. Another thing that we talked about was the fact that some of these things can be, uh, you can have things and, and be asymptomatic. So those are, I mean, I think a lot of talks I'll do, I talk a lot about blood pressure and, and um, diabetes just because I have a lot of patients with both of these issues. And um, it's like sort of like something I have to deal with on a very everyday basis. Uh, we almost always talk about lifestyle stuff that gets kind of lost in a lot of people. We, we just focus a lot on medications, but that should always be considered. Um, Sometimes some tests are, you know, are helpful and important and sometimes ordering overdoing tests. I know in, I, I know in the States it's very different so to, you know, people can just sort of like pay and get a test done. And so, uh, you know, I, I, there, there are some um, places even in Canada where they do these paid for tests and people just do like head to toe physicals and they just do physicals, the same fun word, uh, but they basically do a whole bunch of extra tests and stuff. And sometimes it just, it, it, I, I've seen those reports and sometimes they just lead people down um, doing more tests. I, it, I guess it depends on which um, uh, school of thought. When I first started, I thought that it would be best to just know, cause I would think I would wanna know, but having now done this job for a little bit of time, I realized that sometimes really overdoing stuff sometimes doesn't actually help people out. So there is, I, I do understand now after a bit of time why, you know, we have certain guidelines in place. We didn't talk so much about it, but social factors um, in terms of like, you know, for this patient, like, you know, her background may pay, may kind of play a role in the types of food that they eat, uh, uh, sorry, she eats. So, you know, we might have to be cognizant of like whether or not uh, she will make certain changes based on that. Um, and, you know, I, I'm actually will advocate a lot of time for people to like, like I said, push people to kind of do certain tasks. Um, and sometimes I sort of let go. And so, you know, especially if I see people in, in person, sometimes I can be like, oh, you're going to get your shot today. Right. Um, and, and, you know, you should probably get this and, you know, and, I'll, and sometimes I'll describe, you know, 
getting the, the thing myself or to give a personal example so it kind of makes people feel like oh the doctor is also getting this so you know I, I you know makes sense for me to get it as well too um I had a recently a patient who had the flu shot and um she basically told me that she you know had a bad experience like you know like the last time she took it and she, you know, like didn't want to take it and she agreed to do it. And then eventually, you know, she didn't have any symptoms. So she convinced all of her family members to get the flu shot. So in the fact, she actually called me to tell me that she was happy that I convinced her to do this. And, you know, they survived the winter without getting sick, et cetera. So sometimes we got to be a bit pushy, but I think it's, it's easier when you have a good relationship with your patients. So that's the end of me talking uh, for now. Um, but thank you guys for listening and interacting. I did leave my contact information here. Um, you, you're more than welcome to email me. Uh, hey, Dr. Sarah is my Instagram handle. You're more than welcome to, to message me there as well too, or follow me. And um, I don't know how long I talked, but I, I probably a lot. Uh, you guys are welcome to ask me any questions you have, whether it's about the case or just medicine in general or anything really, I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, there's actually a question from yeah. Miko. They asked, a bit off topic, if the patient had come in with family, such as their kids, how would you have balanced the communication with the patient versus their family? Sure, like we're talking about, so like their third year old. It, um, so it, it depends, right? So I mean, I, a lot of times people come in with their, with their whether it's spouses or kids or that kind of stuff. Um, I, you know, uh, I assume that whenever someone is in with them, I usually just ask if people feel comfortable with me having conversations openly in front. I know I'm trying to think, I, I don't know that I would change the conversation too much. Um, uh, you know, unless, you know, sometimes the, the, the kids come in with their own concerns. So sometimes you have to balance out what, what they're telling you and what the patient's telling you. Um, Sometimes, sometimes like having uh, someone else can, can be helpful in corroborating information. Like, you know, whether I didn't do this, in this example, but a lot of times people aren't really taking their medications correctly or that kind of thing. And sometimes like, you know, children or something can um, uh, give you a little bit more information on that, but I'm not sure if I, I don't know if I answered the question properly. Cause I'm not sure if I understood like what, in what specific way. Um, I think in general, I don't think it would change my, um, interaction too much I I usually you know if it's the patient I'm usually refer like I'm usually talking to the patient but I'll, when I come into a room I'm usually you know acknowledge that there's obviously someone else there um a lot of times people's uh, uh patients kids also or children are also my patients so they're probably my patients as well too so it's probably a little bit easier for me um but if there's something more so that you know uh that you want to have me answer I'm more than happy to answer that too um, yeah, Nico actually said thank you and that answered his, uh, their question. Okay, perfect, perfect, perfect. That's great. Um, if anyone has any questions, you can unmute yourself or you can type it in the chat. I do have one thing I wanted to ask. Um, okay. I think, I don't know if it was in the bio that you gave us or if we said it at the beginning, but uh, that you do cosmetic injections. Yes, yes. That's something that you have to do extra training for yeah, it's a good question. I don't, I've been asked the question before. I just don't know the answer in this, like whether or not in the state. So um, when we do family medicine, our residency here is actually two years in the States, it's three years. And, you know, basically when I was doing my residency, one of the doctors I worked with, she did some uh, cosmetic treatments. Just, though it, she just sort of did like very basic stuff for her own patients. So it's just something they wanted her to do. And so, uh, my, the clinic I work in, um, they only had room for me a certain number of days. So I needed, I wanted to do something kind of else. And uh, I ended up doing extra training in um, sort of cos like non-surgical cosmetic stuff. And um, I contacted a bunch of clinics and I ended up joining the clinic that I currently work in. And I think this is like my fifth year, I think working there. Um, and I, I, to be honest, I really enjoy it. It's very different than what I do. So obviously cosmetics is, uh, most of the people I deal with are a more high influential area. It's a little bit artistic and I get to use my hands, which I find really kind of a very nice change. Um, uh, whereas a lot of the times when I'm talking to patients, I'm, I deal with a lot of mental health too. So I, a lot, and of course, a lot of this blood pressure, all this stuff is, there's a lot of talking involved in counseling. So they're very different, but to answer your question, yes, I did actually do extra training. I, you know, um, a lot of times, you know, you'll see, so here you will see family doctors do this. I know a lot of times in the States, you'll see a lot of, um, 
uh, dermatologists and plastic surgeons doing this. You can actually be a nurse as well and be an, a nurse injector as well too. You just need to have the um, uh, orders from a doctor. So that would be your other thing. We actually have nurse practitioners here as well too and nurse practitioners practice independently so they can also perform and, and be trained to do injections as well too. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, of course. Um, while I wait for other people to type in the chat, you guys can also raise your hand because I know like sometimes when there's not people talking, I just talk a lot. But... That's okay. I talk a lot too. So I, I definitely get that. But I was not a talker when I was listening to presentations. So. Well, you guys can always interrupt and like put raise your hand. I don't know if you all know the feature, but um, in the reactions tab, you can. So I see Caitlin, you unmuted yourself. So I'll stop talking. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, what is your least favorite part of family medicine? And if you had to redo your um, like med school, would you choose the same specialty? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. So, so like I, I kind of alluded a little bit before, I actually wanted to be a specialist. And when I was younger, I wanted to be a pediatrician, actually. I just thought I really loved kids. And as I went through uh, medical school, I realized I don't think I really want to deal exclusively with though it's not exclusive, but like with a lot of sick kids. So I, I, what I like about family medicine is I mostly see um, people, babies for well baby checks and most of them tend to be healthy. And it's kind of, it's actually a fun part of my day. Um, I don't think I would probably change my mind. So actually, you know, I, I think I figured out what I want to do maybe in third year of um, end of third year, almost when I was applying for my electives in fourth year. And so I started changing my mind a lot. I, I again, at one point I almost thought about being a, a dermatologist. I actually started, I booked all my electives for that. And then in the end, again, I was like, I don't know if I could just see skin. So I think the thing that, that really kind of helped me was um, doing a lot of electives and like training with, you know, just even if you like shadow people, you get to see what their days are like. I thought the eye was super interesting, but then I like, I realized like, I like the, like staring into the little microscope. I don't know that I, started to like fall asleep a little I don't know it's probably different when you actually work and and do it I just didn't think that that was um my calling um most ophthalmologists are actually surgeons as well too so just I didn't know if I wanted to do a surgical specialty though I really enjoyed surgery so I, I didn't I think that the the one thing that I the advice I would give is that there's a lot of people who came into medical school knowing exactly what they wanted I had a lot of um colleagues who were like I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this and then at the end, didn't even pick what they were gung ho about doing. So I would just keep an open mind. And so I personally really like family medicine. The thing I hate the most about it is paperwork. It's a lot of paperwork in it. That's yeah. If there's some, so, you know, I, and I guess it probably varies. So we have, um, you know, you can practice at a walk-in clinic. So walk-in clinic, you basically deal with, you know, an issue as it comes and the more, more or less urgent issues. And so it's a very different style of practice than what you saw in my presentation, right? I did a lot of preventative care here, you know, as a walk-in, you would just sort of see like someone has a bladder infection, you treat the bladder infection and they go home. And because this is the question, the things are kind of simpler, you'll see like a higher volume load, um, but you're not, I, I don't, Personally, it's not my favorite style of medicine because like you don't focus on a lot of the prevention, but in that case, you would probably have less paperwork. Um, you know, for the paperwork comes from people who like get into work injuries or uh, they need forms to be filled out for work, filled out for, you know, when you apply for medical school, you need to have these forms filled out to say that you are like, you don't have TB, you don't have any immunizations. I fill out all those forms and I have a lot of people that I fill these forms out for, so. I have a lot of people on disability, so forms, paperwork, that's my least favorite job, part of the job, yeah. And sorry, one other, and, and you know what, I, what a lot of people don't know is I, you know, all the tests and stuff that you order, um, you, like, you, you don't necessarily have a time of the day that's booked just for that, and you're not necessarily paid for that, so, but you're responsible for it, so uh, a lot of times in the evenings or sometimes on weekends, I'll just sort of, like, pop in to see what's kind of going on, so, uh, there's that aspect. But the one thing I do like, as opposed to if you're someone who works in the hospital, is I'm, I'm not usually on call. So it means that when my day is over, or my clinic is over, if someone has a problem, they actually call the walk-in clinic. We have, have walk-ins in the evening, so they'll actually call whoever's on for walk-in, or if it's an emergency, they go to the hospital. So you don't have a, I don't have a pager, so that's nice. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Uh, so we have a question from Nico. They asked, uh, what are some unique challenges or positives you've 
you weren't expecting with virtual care? Oh, yeah. also a great question. So honestly, when I first started, I didn't know how we were going to do virtual care because we're none of us had ever worked or I, I should say very little, very few of us had worked in virtual care. And like I sort of alluded to, I, I'm able to do about 80, 90% of my job pretty well. Um, you know, I'll, again, I talk to people and, you know, if I need to send them a paper or a requisition, I can send it by email. Uh, some people have a rack. I can actually get them to email it to me if they feel comfortable. Um, you know, sometimes, it, for example, a lot of people would have to actually, some workplaces are really challenging. They have to take a full day off of work, even just to see me for a little bit. So the fact that I can kind of call people at work, they can be on their break, they can talk to me, they can give, they can talk to me about their problem and then go back to work. I think for some people has been really helpful. The, the challenges have been some people are really bad historians slash people, some people just cannot explain things on the telephone. So you'll ask them and you, you get stuck in this like loop de loop of trying to understand what they're trying to tell you. Um, so some people I've had to just bring in because I just didn't understand what they were trying to tell me. And they had to like physically bring it like, you know, it's like, oh, I take this medication, but I'm not taking it anymore. But it's a, a little pill that looks like this. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know what they're talking about because I can't visualize. And uh, so some people it is easier. Uh, like someone mentioned, definitely, we probably, in the beginning part, at least, you know, I talked a lot and not a lot about preventative stuff, but like in the beginning of the pandemic, I didn't do that much prevention because of the fact that like mammograms, we were telling people not to do them, um, pap tests, we were telling people not to do them, because we didn't know how long all of this was going to last. But once it sort of lasted a certain point, we were like, no, we should really uh, go back to screening and to make sure that we're not, you know, just because of COVID now we're going to create so many other problems, pros and cons. I think in an ideal world, it, it, I feel like this, you know, doing it a couple of days at home and then coming in one or two times a week is actually not bad because anyone I, I need to see in person, babies, some diabetics, I, I book them all on the same day. And I, I find it, the system generally works pretty well. Yeah. Thank you for answering that. Yeah. Um, since we are getting close to time, I, like we'll take a couple more questions just to make yeah, sure. Yeah, of course, yeah. So Sophia asked, uh, do you feel it's a bit more flexible working in family medicine than working at a hospital environment? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely do. I mean, it depends on what you're doing in the hospital. I think surgeons probably have the most, um, you know, if you're, if you're operating, you're very reliant on the schedule of the operating room. Um, I, I bet you it's probably a bit different in the States than it is here. So as a family doctor, like I actually have to like, I've actually closed my practice. I just, I can't take care of any more people. Um, whereas I think I, from what I gather in the States is like, you guys most, they're trying to like attract more people to your practice. Um, I don't have, like, I almost feel like we need more family doctor or more doctors here to sort of balance out all the patients that need to be seen. When you work in the hospital, it depends on what you're doing. Some people, like if you're, some people, some of my friends hated clinics and they would just never do it. So um, I loved clinics. So that's why I probably went the direction I did. Um, you know, again, like I sort of alluded to, like if you're on call and stuff like that, um, you know, in, in the hospital, you depends on what the specialty. Some, some of them require a lot more calls, some of them, um, require a lot more like rounding on patients. And sometimes you have to stay in the hospital. Um, some of my, some of my friends who do hospital work, they can actually go home and they can do home call as well too. So um, I, I think, you know, with family medicine, you can work to almost as little or as many days as you like. Uh, you can do um, it, like for us here, at least you can do an extra uh, training in obstetrics in um, care of the elderly, in palliative care, as a surgical assist, as an anesthesi in anesthesiology in eMERGE. So you can actually do like, I have friends who are family doctors, but they work almost exclusively in the eMERGE. They did extra training in that. So I, I the, like, they think of the, what kind of convinced me is that the flexibility of family medicine and like not only just the hours, but like what the scope of what you can actually do. Yeah, thank you for answering that. That's actually kind of cool. <laughs> they get to do that. Yeah, I, I didn't actually, you know, I'm telling you, really, I didn't think of, I, I, like, family medicine would have been the last place I would have thought myself, finding myself, yeah. Um, so we'll take, we'll take, like, two more questions. Sure. Um, if anyone wants to unmute themselves or type in the chat right now, you can.
And if you guys are anxious or whatever you want to think about it, you can you can also, like I said, you can either send me uh, an email or, or um, send me a message on Instagram and that's totally fine as well too. So I've definitely received uh, the questions afterwards. So it's totally fine. Sometimes you don't feel like uh, asking, but. Um, Nico asked a question. That's actually a cool question, but the yeah. what advice would you give to your pre-med self? Uh, so, I mean, depends on what your pre-med self is. So my pre-med self was uh, <laughs> uh, pretty OCD. So uh, in high school, I was very like type A. I had like my notes had to be done a very specific way and I was pretty high strong. Um, so actually I, I did have a moment where I, you know, when I, right when I turned 20, so I, I realized that I was, if I continued at the pace that I was going and being too worked up about everything that I would never make it to medical school. Cause I was like, wow, I'm gonna have like, I have like 10 more years to go to get there. And if I'm this worried about everything, I'm never gonna make it. I'm gonna burn out before I get there. So uh, for, for me as my, um, if I looked at myself, I, like I said, I was very high strung. So um, this relaxing kind of a little bit and just enjoying a little bit of the journey of life and kind of, you know, accepting kind of the path of sort of getting there yeah I used to get really worked up if I got like a bad mark and like you know just I didn't take things very well which is very different than uh where I am now um I definitely would also just say that when you're applying and you know they always tell you to sort of do activities and stuff like that I would, I would just do activities that you love um and I, I actually I don't know I think for me consistency in activities too um, like I worked at a language school um, from the time I was 14. I think I worked until I was like 22 or something like that. I don't, I kind of forget. Um, but I kept it as a job and it was just like on Saturday. So it was just once a week. Uh, I tutored for several years. I, um, some, a lot of the activities I actually did for longer periods of time and they, they weren't necessarily in medicine, but I learned a lot from them. So in the language school I spoke, I had to do like basically register people who didn't speak English, uh, he had to learn different forms of communication. And I like, I use that example in my med school interviews all the time for examples of like, you know, dealing with difficult situations, dealing with difficult people. So if you're, if you enjoy or are passionate about whatever thing you choose, could be sports or any other activity. Uh, I think that if you're able to um, continue with that and uh, the other advice I'd give is sometimes you forget, but actually write down all the activities you do because sometimes you forget like any, any volunteering thing that you do, I would just write down because you forget afterwards. So having a, keeping a track, um, but um, the, the quality, and you probably didn't answer, ask this question, but I'll just, and I'll give it anyways. Um, I think the qualities I think that are most um, helpful are probably someone who is keen and enthusiastic, even in areas that they're not keen and enthusiastic about. So while I, when I did all of my rotations, there's things I clearly didn't like, but I tried to be open to everything and tried to ask questions in all of those areas so that, you know, I always was in the process of learning. I found that if you were engaged and interested in learning, people were much more likely to teach you. I saw people who had so really attitude. It's really anyone who had a bad attitude. I feel like um, you can be as smart as you are, um, but I think if you have a bad attitude, people don't really appreciate that, even whether it is in interviews or even afterwards. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I know a lot of us are still very type A, so yes, <laughs> I have learned, but it's still it's not always easy, but. Um, I mean, I still have like, like plans of like, this is how I need to run things, but I'm definitely a lot more relaxed about a lot of things. And, you know, I'm, I think, you know, actually med school actually taught me this, you know, you get thrown into situations where you're, and on, in all honesty, like put with doctors who are some of them not very nice. Um, you're put with people like you have to sort of, you change your environment a lot. So you have to be okay with, you know, you come on to a new place and if you can be nice to the admin person that's there, they'll probably be nice back to you generally. Um, you know, being nice but nice to the nurses, that always helps because a lot of times they've saved, they've saved me a lot of times. So it's like, I don't know how to do this. Can you tell me how to do this? And um, you know, I, I think if you're if you come in sort of like open and kind, I feel like a lot of people help you versus if you come in with attitude. But I but I yeah, it's hard to unlearn being really type A. 
but to, to be fair, type A actually did like being organized does help you. So not to say that you should not be, but um, just learning to balance a bit. Uh, so for our last question, um, a lot, I'm so sorry if I mispronounced your name, but uh, they asked, do you see a lot of physician assistants working in family medicine? And do you see a big difference in the way they work compared uh, to how you work as a doctor? Yeah, so uh, not tons, actually. So it's actually interesting because like we, you guys have um, DOs, we don't have them really here. And even the physician assistants, the, the programs for that are relatively new in Canada. So we don't have tons. And I, I'm trying to remember, um, I don't know if I've ever really, so I, I volunteer once a month at this medical clinic. It's basically for people who are like re refugees or people who don't have actual um, health cards. So they, they, they can't get access for free. And we do have physician assistants there. Um, uh, so that, that would probably be my own only experience that I can really comment on. Um, to me, I find them actually very helpful, but I've also found med students very helpful. Uh, generally, it's like so, some med students, maybe less so, but I feel like the majority of, of it is actually, I find them both, both med students and MPs very helpful in the sense that, you know, a, a lot of, you know, when you get, um, when you're in medicine for a longer time and you get to know patients, sometimes it's not that you cut corners, but you feel like you already know certain things about people. Whereas I think when you see a PA or you see a med student, I find them very thorough and they will ask a lot of outside questions, which I remember what it's, it's what I did too when I was like a med student and a resident. Cause you don't really like, you don't really know how to formulate an idea. So you just ask a lot of questions and hope that you get to the answer. Um, so I do find them very helpful, but I, I don't know if I can comment so much on them in general, just because I haven't had so much exposure to them yet to be able to comment really. Um, but I, the ones I have worked with have been really helpful. Uh, yeah, I, I, the question was about a little bit. So I, I think the limitations would just be in terms of like, uh, they have certain things that they're able to do and certain things are not able to do, but it's same thing. Like I have, you know, the nurses that work in my clinic, I have like one of the nurses was being there forever. And honestly, she's so fantastic that like, you know, even through this pandemic, she's like taking care of like scheduling and she's done a lot of the pap tests she does. She, her, she's I think really gone a little bit like to the maximum of her scope of practice. So again, I think that within even each special, like each role, you'll find people who excel or not. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, the super informational session. I know that we definitely learned a lot um, and I really enjoyed how interactive you made it with asking all the questions. So I know our members enjoy that because they've definitely said before that they love um, these sessions where they're asked questions. And I also hope to have a session with you again in the future. So if you'd like to post your social media handles or links to your business endeavors in the chat, you can do that. Um, I know you have your contact info there. So um, yeah. this can also, are they okay to take a screenshot of it? Sure, yeah, yeah, not a problem at all. Right. Thank you so much. And no to our- problem. Thanks. And obviously, you know, I had a little bit of a different perspective. So hopefully it's still helpful um, being being in Canada. It's a little bit slightly different, but I know a lot of the stuff is relatively pretty similar. Yeah. So I think we actually have, I don't know if we have Canadian students in the uh, session right now, but WSU has a few Canadian students. I've, 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 I've seen in a lot of the, the chats I've done or the talks I've done, I, I, I will find a couple in there who then email me to tell me that. So yeah, but uh, so a lot in the beginning, I did a lot more just um, based on the American guidelines and I sort of changed a little bit to sort of try to incorporate both just in case. Yeah. Yeah. So to our WSU students, if you could complete the survey that's in the Zoom chat and summarize the session to obtain your shout out hours. Um, and thank you guys for being here today. And I hope everyone has a great night.